9th of January, 1844. To the Right Honourable John Singleton, Lord High Chancellor of Great Britain. Humbly complaining unto your Lordship the orator Charles Dickens is an author of several books which have been printed and published and very extensively sold, and whereby orator has established his reputation as a popular author and has derived great pecuniary profits. And that before the month of December 1843, your orator invented, composed and wrote an original tale or book entitled A Christmas Carol in Prose, being a ghost story of Christmas. And the same as a work of invention and fancy, and that the subjects and incidents thereof, and the characters and personages therein, introduced and described, are of your orator's sole invention. Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, published in December 1843, is perhaps one of the great author's most beloved works. Ebenezer Scrooge, Bob Cratchit, Tiny Tim and the Ghosts of Christmas's Past, Present and Future are synonymous with the holiday, and the happy Christmas dinners and parties depicted in the tale in many ways codified the idealised image of an English Christmas. The book was an immediate and enduring success, as popular in the early years of Queen Victoria's reign as it was when the Muppets adapted it in 1992. So why on earth do we find Dickens talking about his book in court just a month after it was first published? It is a tale of artistic piracy, wounded pride, legal folly. As utterly devoid of Christmas cheer as Mr Scrooge is prior to his visitation, and one which would come to haunt Dickens' writing and the British legal system for years to come. Hi, my name is Christopher Day, and I'm Head of Modern Domestic Records at the National Archives. As the archive of the UK government, we hold millions of records, from the Doomsday Book to the UK government web archive. Among these collections, we hold many thousands of legal records, including those of the Court of Chancery. We find Dickens pleading his case in 1844. The Court of Chancery was a court of equity, where people came to settle cases that could not be solved by common law courts, which based their judgments on statutes and on precedent of previous legal cases. Dickens came to the court in January 1844 to sue two publishers, Richard Egan Lee and John Haddock. He accused the men of damaging his artistic and financial position. They had pirated his Christmas Carol. But it wasn't quite as straightforward as a direct ripoff. Examining the legal documents submitted to the court by Dickens' lawyer, making allegations against Lee and Haddock and requesting the court redress these, called a bill, we see that the matter is a little knottier. For Lee and Haddock hadn't just published and sold a direct imitation of the Christmas Carol, for one thing, they had changed his title. Gone was Dickens' original title, A Christmas Carol in Prose, being a ghost story of Christmas. Instead, Lee and Haddock were selling the not wildly different A Christmas Ghost Story, re-originated from the original by Charles Dickens' Esquire, and analytically condensed expressly for this work. So how does one re-originate and analytically condense a work of fiction? It seems it is more or less direct plagiarism. A Christmas Ghost Story was published by Lee and Haddock as part of a series of such rip-offs written by a hack writer called Henry Hewitt and edited by Lee. Hewitt's reorigination doesn't seem to have gone much beyond a bit of abridgment and paraphrase, though. The work was, Dickens' Bill stated, a colourable imitation of one half of your orator's book, a mere piracy. The subject, characters, personages and incidents are taken from and are the same as those contained in your orator's work, except the name of one of the personages in your orator's book, called Fezziwig, is in the defendant's publication called Fuzzy Wig. In many instances, the language of the defendant's publication is the same with that of your orator's book. This was not the first time Dickens had fallen prey to such acts of re-origination, re not least by Lee and Haddock even, but it was the first time he had sought, sought such legal redress. Partly, it was different this time because of changes to the copyright laws in 1842, strengthening the hands of authors like Dickens in these cases, but he was also driven to court by concerns for his bank balance and his business. A Christmas Carol was incredibly successful almost immediately, selling over 15,000 copies within its first year. Furthermore, it was an opportunity for Dickens, whose finances were not so sound at this point, to make money. Carol was sold for a price of five shillings per copy, a lot of money for a work of its length and print quality. Leon Haddock's A Christmas Ghost Story, however, was sold for a mere two pence. Dickens was clearly worried that with this and the publication of a rip-off of the second part of his Christmas Carol, for a similar price, his festive cash cow was at risk of being undercut by a cheap imitation. So he sued, but he didn't just sue Lee and Haddock, the ostensible publishers, but instead filed near identical bills with the court against four others, two days later on the 11th of January, against George Berger, John Cleave, William Strange, and William Clark. These men had been named in the cover pages of A Christmas Ghost Story as being distributors or sellers. Dickens and his lawyers, keen to snuff this out once and for all, pursued everyone connected with the publication, as they were unsure who was, to, who was involved and to what extent. 
Their desire to get to the bottom of the matter is clearly communicated in the demands and questions they pose in their bill, interrogations as they are known in the language of the court. Dickens' lawyer John Macon made these demands of Leon Haddock, as well as calling on the court to grant uh, Dickens himself redress and compensation for these matters. Leon and Haddock were asked to disprove the fact that they had produced nothing more than a colourable imitation of Dickens' carol, one that was impured and degraded as a result. They were instructed to hand over their accounts, their memorandums and other documents which would show who was involved in the publication, how many copies were printed, how many were sold and for what profit, and how many were left and who had them in their hands. Furthermore, Dickens requested the court restrain Lee, Haddock and the others from printing, publishing, selling or otherwise disposing of the said publication, which has been commenced by them under the title A Christmas Ghost Story, or any continuation or other part thereof, and from copying or imitating in whole or in part your orator's said book entitled A Christmas Carol in Prose, being a ghost story of Christmas. Finally, the bill requested the court force the dependents to destroy or hand over for destruction any remaining copies of their imitation. They must pay Dickens their profits, the bill asks, and also pay his legal costs too. These were not insignificant. It is likely that his actions cost him around £700, a sum equivalent, a sum equivalent to around £90,000 in today's money. So, what was the result of this action? Well, in all the cases Dickens brought before the court, he was immediately granted a temporary order forbidding the sale, distribution or continuation by them of a Christmas ghost story. The defendants, it seemed, had no leg to stand on, as Dickens' lawyer argued, according to the Times newspaper, whilst Dickens in his Christmas Carol had sought to, to seize upon the associations belonging to Christmas and embody them in a more permanent form. His imitators merely stole his idea and changed a few words, hoping to convince the public that they might have the same smash hit story, but for significantly less money. The only difference between the two works, Dickens' lawyer said, was that the language of the piracy was in some places condensed, and in others amplified in a manner which must have been anything but flattering or satisfactory to Mr. Dickens. Berger, Cleve, Strange and Clark yielded over to the court's temporary order. The paper trail ends there, and we can only assume that they destroyed or delivered up their remaining copies of a Christmas Coast story to Dickens. They had little chance of winning the case, they realised. But Leon Haddock, perhaps motivated by the fact that this would undermine the very practice of their business in general, fought the case, and in spectacular style. The National Archives holds depositions, uh, the technical term for witness statements effectively, submitted by Richard Egan Lee and Henry Hewitt, the writer, and those depositions submitted to the court in response to Dickens' charges, in which they make the claim to have actually done Dickens a favour in their work by improving his shoddy writing and, and improving his plotting to produce a better and in that way more original work. So far from the Christmas ghost story being a colourable imitation, stated Lee, it's actually a refinement. Hewitt, he said, had tastefully remedied numerous incongruities and unhingings of the plot in the original. Hewitt concurred with his editor. Such were the problems with Dickens' prose, that he had many times apparently had to abandon it and substitute it with what he verily believes to be a more artistical style of expression in order to improve the tale and render the same more consistent and to give greater effect to the leading incidences therein. His impudence and insult were for nothing, though, the court found in Dickens' favour. But did he really win? Possibly not. For having spent a vast amount of money to stir up the financial viability of his Christmas carol, Dickens found himself out of pocket. Lee and Haddock, facing the loss of their business, their stock, and the cost of their legal fees trying to fight the case, declared bankruptcy in 1844, as recorded in the London Gazette, copies of which are held by the National Archives. So there was no one with any money to pay Dickens' legal fees or his requested damages, and he had to borrow money to stay afloat himself. But he did get revenge of a sort. Infuriated by the costs and complications associated with bringing a case in the Court of Chancery, Dickens became involved in campaigns for its reform. Like so many of the social causes he championed, he ended up being satirised in one of his novels. Bleak House was published in 1852, and just as Dickens had, according to his lawyer in Christmas Carol, given the festive season a more permanent embodiment, Bleak House remains the enduring artistic portrayal of Chancery's dysfunction. The case of Jarndyce and Jarndyce, over a disputed inheritance which has itself been eaten up by the legal fees associated with the prosecuting the case in the court, are central to the plot. Dickens even gave Chancery a fictional motto, no doubt informed by his own experiences of it, suffer any wrong that can be done to you, rather than come here. Chancery was, in no little part thanks to campaigners like Dickens, reformed drastically in the 1870s, but he never got his money back. We can only hope that he was as at ease and philosophical as Mr Scrooge on Christmas morning. <laughs>